So this was the Ayuba Suleiman or Job ben Solomon is um, is the first person first person that we know of today who is a practicing um, Muslim in the United States. He's captured uh, while going to sell uh, 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 um, slaves himself uh, for paper, and um, he's captured because he didn't like the price he was going to get from one place, so he decided to go to another place, and he's captured and sold into slavery by a tribe that later on becomes Muslim, the Mandinka that we read about yesterday in the Sons of Independence. Um, he comes uh, to what's today Maryland. Um, he's there for, uh, for a while. We have a biography of him um, that's available, written by a fellow named Blewett. Um, that you could easily access online through the University of North Carolina's um, uh, Documents of the South um, website. And um, Blewett meets him in a tavern because he had run away and he was jailed in a tavern and sees that he's written scribbling stuff on walls um, that look like Arabic and says things that sound like Arabic. And um, he refused to drink wine. Um, so he finds out that he's uh, he's Muslim and becomes very interested in him and starts trying to raise money to be able to buy his freedom and ends up buying his freedom and he ends up in, the, in, the, uh, in England. Um, the person actually pays for his trip back to, uh, uh, trip to England um, was uh, the first governor of Georgia, uh, Oglethorpe. And uh, while he's in England, he meets with major scientists. He meets George Sale, who did one of the best English translations in the 18th century of the Quran. Um, he writes the Quran from memory. And uh, this is one of these, again, astonishing things that I didn't know. A colleague of mine about a few months ago um, sent me a note saying that the Quran that he had handwritten was sold uh, uh, by one of the, I forget exactly what, what one of these auction houses for $33,000 recently, and someone in California actually had the Quran. Uh, and us scholars had never seen it and never knew about it. <laughs> uh, and we had just you know, heard about Blewett saying that during the time he was with me, he wrote the Quran from memory uh, a couple of times. Uh, but one of these Qurans was actually recently sold for $33,000. Seems like a bargain. Um, uh, and uh, he also meets with the royal family, and what people begin to do is look at him and say, like, oh, here's a person that we could converse with and could help us expand our trade in, um, in West Africa, into Central Africa. And so they hire him in the Royal African Company as an agent to expand the trade of, um, of, the, uh, the, British, uh, of the English into uh, Western, uh, Western Central Africa. For the most part, it's unsuccessful. Um, he goes, and what we end up hearing about is that you know he's asking for uh, more money to be able to go for, do, uh, for further into Central Africa, and the Royal African Company finds out that the trade that they had expected doesn't actually occur, and he's sort of left alone, and and uh, uh, you know we don't hear much about him afterwards. Um, but the reason why I mentioned this again, uh, there was a biography of him written. Um, called the fortunate slave, and he's in that scene as this very quaint figure that was exceptional in this period that we sort of read about and say, oh, how interesting. But he was actually part of this exact connections that we were talking about, the transatlantic connections of the Atlantic world that existed between West Africa, Western Europe, and it exemplifies what people were hoping to do through this Atlantic trade. Um, and Muslims were seen as intermediaries in these in, because, in part, um, they were able to, some of them were able to read and write. Um, they were seen as semi-civilized as opposed to the uh, non-civilized natives of West Africa. So they were seen as p people who could be in possible intermediaries. And they play this role throughout the uh, American history in the colonial and antebellum period. And I talk about this as uh, they were seen as these liminal figures, figures through whom America sort of self-identified. America identified itself, defined itself, defined its own identity, um, particularly in relationship to um, slavery by ascribing to them the things that they, they saw themselves as doing. So what they, by doing this, they saw themselves as um, bringing civilization um, to West Africa. So he was sent to West Africa with a bunch of tools that were supposed to be able to be used um, by, by uh, 
and his compatriots so that he could bring industry to West Africa and civilize West Africa. And Muslims are seeing, again, it's playing this type of intermediary role, making this possible. Um, and Blewett, who writes about him, if um, you get a chance to look at his biography more fully, has this wonderful section where he talks about the role hospitality ought to play. And this, again, is very interesting. So he talks about the English need to be hospitable to folks like um, Joe Ben Solomon or Ayuba because um, that's what God would do. Um, that we need to imitate the sort of the, the, the uh, generosity and hospitality of the of the divine. That by being hospitable, we are doing as God would act, which again is very telling of the way in which the the empire, the English Empire, saw itself. And the name of the biography is a long name that essentially is about the life of Job Ben Solomon, um, and uh, it's by Thomas Blewett. B L U E T T. Um, and we have two portraits of um, Ayuba or Job um, that had um, that have been done. And oh, no, I'm sorry, yeah, one of one uh, portrait of him that had been done when he was in England. Another one of these very interesting figures that shows how Muslims were intermediaries in this period and these liminal figures in this, in this period is Abdul Rahman Ibrahim. Um, Abdul Rahman actually claimed to be the son of Ibrahim Suri, uh, who was one of the major leaders of the states in, in West Africa that were expanding in this period. And he was captured while, had, while going on a raid and sold into um, slavery. Um, I should mention that Ayuba was actually captured along with a translator that he had, and both were sold into slavery, and we know that both of them came to, the, to uh, America, colonial America, but we never hear anything about his translator ever since. Um, so there were a lot of figure, people like this that we never know, hear about at all. Um, and the man, when he comes and he's sold into um, uh, slavery, um, he ends up in, Nas in Natchez, Mississippi. There's a wonderful... Uh, documentary that's done, uh, or not semi doc film that's done about his uh, his life, and um, that's on. Uh, Susan mentioned that he she mentioned to you the um, this website that we did for the uh, Muslim Journeys project with the NEH. Did she? No. Yeah, there's a Bridging Cultures Muslim Journeys project um, that I have written a, a sort of biography questions for that film and um, the book that that film is based on. Um, uh, is it's a wonderful uh, it's a wonderful book by Terry Alford and that's also on that on that website if you want to um, take a look at it um, that traces his life and shows again how the Muslims who were involved in the transatlantic slave trade and in the economy of the Atlantic world more uh, more generally you know helped shape the way in which we think about. Um, uh, well, help, help, shape, help us understand or shed a new light on the way in which we think about uh, American history more generally. So Ibrahima is caught and brought into Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, he's sold into slavery there. Um, the knowledge he had of going indigo and rice is used in, in Natchez, Mississippi um, to make his owner rich. His owner wasn't actually very wealthy. Over the period that he had him, uh, the, his owner becomes extremely wealthy. Um, uh, Ibrahim uh, uh, becomes a slave in the, the, sla uh, in the plantation. Um, a fellow, um, Dr. Cox, who had been stranded at one point in West Africa and um, become, had become very ill, is saved by Ibrahim's father, in, was saved in, by Ibrahim's father, brought into Ibrahim's father's court, and by chance, he runs into uh, Abdurrahman in Natchez, Mississippi, and tries to buy his freedom. And because he was so essential uh, to, his, to the owner of this plantation, his owner, uh, Mr. Foster, decides not to, not to sell him uh, for many years until Dr. Cox actually dies, which is, again, mind-blowing, right? Um, and again, with the way in which these things have been often written about or talked about are these sort of very quaint, quaint um, stories, sort of unusual stories, but they're much more telling of a wider historical phenomenon. 
And I encourage us to think about it in the context of the way in which they evidence something much more wider that was, that was going on rather than seeing them as these quaint figures or um, exceptional, exceptional figures. Um, by the time he's, he's older, he tells his story to a newspaper man in Mississippi who then finds out, uh, who, uh, who, uh, who tells his story to the Secretary of State Clay at the time. And at this time, um, the, uh, uh, there were a number of uh, Americans who had been taken capt as captives or, uh, in the Mediterranean by the, what we call the Barbary States um, in North Africa. And, uh, the State Department thinks that, well, if we say that we have uh, a Muslim slave in our, that we're willing to free, that might buy us some diplomatic uh, goodwill in North Africa to be able to free our own slaves in, uh, in, in North Africa. Uh, free people who have been taken, Americans have been taken captive by these North African states. Um, the newspaper man who tells his story was very aware so this is some guy in Natchez who was very well aware that this may be the case, that this is the way in which the State Department may interpret uh, Abdul Rahman's story. So he's very careful to sell Abdul Rahman not as a West African, but as a quote unquote Moor, uh, a North African, so that the State Department doesn't see him as a black African, but sees him as a, as a Moroccan, or North, what today Morocco, as a, as a North African. And um, the State Department actually agrees um, to not buy his freedom because they didn't want to deal, you know, uh, take away anyone's pri private property rights. Uh, but if his owner was willing to sell him, or uh, free him, uh, the State Department would pay for his way to come to uh, DC and, and go to the Africas. And before the State Department actually does this, they write to the ambassadors in Africa to say, well, there is such a case, that we have such a person, would it be helpful for you if we do this? And they received word that yes, it would be, it may help us if we have the rep. And, um, uh, is freed and, and you know, it might be seen as a good gesture or a goodwill gesture. Um, now, Abdul Rahman, the way he, he's able to pull the, all of this off is in part by being able to write in Arabic. So a piece of writing that he had done in Arabic was actually sent to Morocco. Um, for the most part, he had forgotten most of his Arabic because when he actually tried to read what he had written, it's all a lot of gibberish. Uh, uh, you know, there are sentences that were taken and repetitively written, um, some of them from a, a fiqh manual that was very popular, a risala that was very popular in West Africa, uh, but he didn't actually write it in a way that one would be able to, uh, to read it.